Good evening. My name is uh, Rudy El Khoury. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight for the Technoglass uh, series. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Technoglass, whose support enables an ambitious program with a yearly theme. And this year, we are looking at water from different disciplinary, geographic, and cultural perspectives to tackle challenging global issues from access to clean water, to the role of water systems in urban design, and of course, sea level rise, salt water infiltration, and coastal resilience, themes which are very central here to our existence in Miami. Well, our speaker tonight, Hank Ovink, also known as the ambassador of water, encompasses in his scope the entire thematic breadth of our series. He is one of the most knowledgeable and influential people when it comes to water and its multiple issues. And we are delighted and thankful that the Consulate General of the Netherlands made it happen tonight. Uh, Mr. Oving was appointed by the Dutch cabinet in 2015 as the first special envoy for international water affairs. He is responsible for advocating water awareness around the world, focusing on building institutional capacity and coalitions among governments, multilateral organizations, private sector, and NGOs to address the world's water-related challenges and to help initiate transformative interventions. Uh, Mr. Oving developed and led Rebuild by Design the landmark competition you are all familiar with that was mounted by President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, where he served as senior advisor to the chair. He also curated Making City, the 2012 International Architectural Biennale in uh, Rotterdam, to name just a couple of his many curatorial and editorial projects. Mr. Oving teaches at the London School of Economics and at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, but also he has uh, many other academic uh, uh, engagements and appointments. Actually, his uh, visit here today uh, initiated uh, a collaboration, a project for collaboration with Delft University, one of the leading universities in the Netherlands, and if you stick to the end, at the conclusion of this program, we are going to ceremonially sign, sign a memorandum of agreement that actually launches this uh, potentially very productive collaboration. So uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Hank Oving. Thank you so much, uh, Dean. Uh, it's an honor to be here and also a great pleasure um, uh, to be in Miami, uh, uh, the second city uh, I visited when coming to the United States in the uh, mid 80s, uh, when my brother uh, was only traveling the world, uh, fell in love. Uh, I think with the city, but actually fell in love with a woman um, and decided to stay for a little while. So I came back and forth and back and forth in this time. So I saw Miami change over a longer period of time. Because, uh, you know, that's, what's that? 30 years ago. Uh, and 30 years ago, Miami was different. Uh, 30 years ago, our thinking on sea level rise and climate change was different. Actually, it was not. The Club of Rome, perhaps you all know, uh, already addressed that, but we didn't understand it right. So I'm going to take you around the world and also bring you back to Miami, I hope. Uh, uh, there's going to be opportunity for questions in the end, uh, but I'm going to start here. Uh, uh, just type in and Google uh, Miami sea level rise, Miami flooding, Miami water, whatever, and the only thing you come up with is disaster. Uh, Miami, the new Atlantis, uh, uh, a quote I once said, uh, sorry for that, but uh, Miami is at the forefront of challenges, uh, perhaps disastrous, uh, but at least I think also an opportunity. Uh, New Yorker uh, uh, illustration, 
actually telling you everything uh, about Miami. Kadir van Lohuizen, a uh, Dutch photographer. There will be an exhibit on his work, hopefully uh, soon in Miami. Uh, travels the world in regards to sea level rise uh, and found Miami at high tide, uh, uh, taking pictures of its vulnerability. Um, its vulnerability in development and assets at risk. Uh, it also its vulnerability from a human uh, perspective. Uh, Miami's man-made, um, Miami's at the edge, uh, so can we change? Florida, uh, Miami is part of Florida, uh, and Florida is very complex when you look at the soil. Uh, we think about uh, the soil system uh, and saying that the, uh, uh, the aquifer, uh, which is what we perceive there's one aquifer in this part of uh, Florida, and it's not. It's a multitude of aquifer, aquifers and they're actually layered. So the top layer of the soil is um, permeable, uh, but then you have a non-permeable layer, and then you have another permeable layer. So the complexity of the soil is not explained right when you say there's only one, only one layer that actually uh, makes, our, uh, uh, makes, our, uh, makes our state uh, uh, um, vulnerable uh, for salination. As you can see, uh, Miami is part of the Avon Park formation, limestone. Uh, it's, uh, this complexity of the state of Florida that makes Miami very vulnerable. So lower levels of soil are already very saline, pink, uh, and the thickness of fresh water is decreasing. Uh, and you see it here, uh, the more color, that means the more towards the red, uh, the less the thickness gets. Uh, and again, you see uh, um, on the uh, on both sides, on the west coast, in, uh, the, uh, in the areas where people actually are, uh, our freshwater system is at risk. Now, uh, we have a, uh, a freshwater system, uh, when you think about the uh, Everglades, uh, and this is how the flow used to be. Uh, you know, it kept uh, the water system healthy. Uh, now, as it goes with nature uh, and man-made intervention, we change that system, uh, as you can see right now. Uh, and uh, it's not a good thing. It's not helping. So it's creating an impact uh, on freshwater, on, sal on our uh, saline uh, uh, part, uh, and on the contamination, but it also creates a direct impact on our economy, on agriculture, but also on the places where we live the places that need that quality. Uh, different perspective. I don't know. I said this today. I don't know why God picked Florida to be so vulnerable. Uh, but you are. You have more sea level rise than other places in the world because of the temperature of the ocean, because of the current, because of the, uh, 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 the hurricanes building up, because of uh, El Nino picking up uh, those differences. And you can see uh, this part uh, of, uh, uh, of the world is more vulnerable and has a bigger impact when it comes to sea level rise. So uh, now, this is Florida 120 years ago. Uh, this is Florida 18,000 years ago. This is Florida how it is today. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be in the future. But if we take the predictions of sea level rise serious, and we better, because uh, they've been right in the past, here you can see what will happen uh, with Florida when you take into account the different levels of sea level rise. It's a lot of water, uh, and this is not surges, so this is not storms, this is just sea level rise. Uh, two feet, nothing, when nothing happens, still at risk. With two feet, I don't know where we are, uh, with four, uh, 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 sorry, uh, with a, a two degrees, uh, which we hope uh, to, re and with four degrees, uh, I don't know where we are. Uh, if you focus in on uh, Miami uh, and on the uh, southern part of Florida, you know uh, this is a risky place. Now that risk is impacting the economy, uh, not only because of the assets at risk and because we invest a lot in the places where we are, uh, uh, it also impacts, uh, um, uh, impacts the economy and the places where we invest. Now, climate change has a different, uh, a different part. It's not only about sea level rise. It's, of course, about temperature rise, heat waves. 
And Florida, again, is such a place where this community, uh, where it gets bigger, warmer and hotter. And we all know that uh, the biggest differences between inner city and outer city might not be here, but the overall average in Florida heating up, and as you can see, is far larger than uh, anywhere else. And that immediately impacts our ecology and environment. It uh, impacts our species uh, and our crops, and it therefore impacts the economy and the places where we live. More dynamics, Florida grows. You know, in the past we had this idea that Florida was old, uh, that when you retire you would go to Florida. It's still the case, but Florida is, a young is becoming a young state. People stay, uh, raise kids and add fam families. Look at the United States and look how the dark colors are in Florida. This is where the boom uh, hits. And it comes together with economic growth. Naples, uh, uh, the villages, uh, Sabring, uh, all parts in Florida in the top 10 of economic growth. But that growth comes with a price because inequality speeds up too. The differences between the rich and the poor increase too. So what you see is inequality is connected to economic growth. So the vulnerability is environmental. The vulnerability is in the ecology. The vulnerability is directly related to climate change. The vulnerability is also economic, urban, and the vulnerability is about social yeah, economic dynamics. And then we have those famous hurricanes. Uh, and if you look at this map, which is always shocking, is that Florida sticks its nose out uh, into these hurricanes. And there's no grand design behind this, but it is a weird image that there is a place on Earth uh, called Florida, and at the, at the front is the, this, this, how do you call it, this pimple uh, on the nose of Florida is Miami, uh, sticking it out into these hurricanes. Water. I'm a water guy, uh, although I'm not. Um, uh, I have a background in architecture, mathematics and art, um, and, uh, being educated in the Netherlands and working in the Netherlands, everything you do in a city has to deal with water. So my first urban plan was an urban water plan. Uh, my first engineering job was a water engine, a riverine water uh, uh, job. So water is in the culture and the DNA of the Netherlands, and it's connected. I'll try to show you. Three uh, inspirations uh, before I get to water. One, Alexander von Humboldt. I guess you all know him, or not. Uh, uh, a little commercial, uh, Andrea Wolf, she's a German researcher, but she wrote it in English, so uh, we can all read it. It's already translated also in Spanish, so uh, that's possible. She wrote The Invention of Nature, uh, a small biography. You can read it on a plane, on a train, or uh, at night on the, on the beach or wherever you are. And it tells the story about von Humboldt. Now, we know von Humboldt a little longer, but this is a way to get direct access to his approach. And why is von Humboldt inspirational for me? Von Humboldt understood the three complexities that are critical for dealing with the world. One, the complexity of the environment and nature. He understood that uh, species and, and, and uh, the way nature works and how the environment reacts and responds is connected. There is a systems approach you have to take. For that, he traveled the world and he came to the Americas, he traveled to Asia. And he made these beautiful drawings to showcase and lay out that complexity of the environment, of nature. So he understood how nature worked, not only in, uh, in the Americas, but he connected that complexity with the way nature actually works all over the world. So he made this comparison, and out of this comparison came the understanding. Second, he understood the complexity of mankind, of social and economic uh, processes. He understood how people behave and what the interdependencies and interconnectivity between the environment and people was. But third, and I think that's the most special part of von Humboldt, and that's the thing where we have to look for in our scientists, in our policymakers, in our businesses, he understood the complexity of politics. So he made the, was able to make the connection between the earth, the environment, uh, uh, the ecology, mankind in its interaction and impact, and the way we deal, design, and decide uh, with that uh, uh, complexity. 
And it made him a person of power, uh, but because he was a scientist, uh, that power was not used in a political sense. He made it to understand better how the world worked and try to inform decision makers uh, uh, and influentials from a community or a political perspective. Second, uh, and this comes from uh, uh, Naomi Klein's, uh, this changes everything. Uh, if we look at the future uh, and we think about the challenges, we know change is critical. Uh, but if we really want to change, an inclusive process is critical where it takes everyone. You can't change the world with only the people you know. And we all know, and since this election in the United States, we uh, know again that thanks to Facebook and the way, you know, way our networks work, but also in the way how governments work, for instance, is that uh, we like to depend on the ones we know. So we close the door and say, let's have a conversation among ourselves. And when we have this conversation, most of the times, uh, our arguments are acknowledged. Uh, and we say, okay, yeah, this is good. We believe, uh, think this is the right way. But there's no countervailing power in that conversation. And then you open the door, and all of, all of a sudden you're surprised. So if you want to bring change, you have to include all. From the beginning, at every step into the process. And this is scary, because it's risky. It's very vulnerable. It's like walking in your underwear on the street, saying, okay, I don't know, can you tell me and help? And I think that vulnerability is critical. Uh, critical to be able to embrace all. Third, there is a role for government, for the state, and we forgot that. Now, Matsukato did a research and said, the state is, has this entrepreneurial capacity. Uh, it was a, almost, a, her research was almost a pamphlet against the people that had critique on government. She showed in her research how the Googles and Apples of the world would never have that innov innovative capacity without uh, the government stepping up, being at the forefront, being the leader to, to get to this, uh, uh, this innovation with uh, forefront funding and focusing on innovation. I think she forgot something. Uh, in her focus uh, to prove the importance of government from an entrepreneurial perspective. And it is the role of the state to enable, uh, the role of the state and the government to mitigate the differences that become too big. We think that the, the, the differences, like you see in Florida, between the rich and the poor are, are increasing that much, a lot of people will fall out. So there's a role, and this is uh, from your constitution. Uh, 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 a part, it tells you that the role of the government is bigger to, than to advocate and invest in innovation. It also is a government that cares uh, and takes care. Now, why has this all to do with water? I don't know. We'll see. Okay. We go to Germany. Uh, just for a slide. Uh, anyone from Germany in the room? That's good. Um, I guess you know her. Uh, this is Mrs. Merkel. Uh, this is 2011, flooding in the Elbe. Uh, Mrs. Merkel looks a little grumpy. Uh, some people say she looks grumpy all the time. I actually advocate against that. She does not, but she looks grumpy here, and I would have done the same in her position. This is the flood protection system of Germany. And Germany is a big economy in the world. It's a big country with a huge impact. If this is the way they protect their cities and citizens and their economy, I would be very grumpy too. <clears throat> On the other side of the canal in Europe, we have Mr. Cameron. Uh, he had actually no flood protection uh, for his citizens. He left office and now the UK will leave the European Union. But this is the way he had to deal with flooding. Uh, the, the, the lack of understanding of water on, in, in, in places at risk in the world, is, uh, uh, this is an example on how it works. Closer at home. Yes, this is Miami. This is the time when there was no understanding. This guy, which is not me, although he's bold, actually got uh, uh, the instruction from his boss to find the leak in the sewage system. And I can tell you, and you know this for sure, there's no leak in the sewage system. It's the ocean coming up almost every week now. So there is no clue when you think about that you have to find the leak in the system and get a picture like this. 
Now too much water comes together with too little water. At the heart of conflicts around the world is the mismanagement of water. Syria drought, long period of drought, caused no water availability in rural places. So people fled to the cities, increasing the conflict, the uproar. Uh, Assad, as an oppressor, enforced this by shutting off water capacity in rural areas. In his hands, water became a weapon of mass destruction. This is happening in other places of the world. We fight wars over water, or wars are started uh, because of water. Colorado River, here in the United States, you actually have a conflict with Mexico, officially over water. So next to the wall, there's something else that is a little older. The Colorado dribbles over the border. And there's a real problem here that the United States now wants to solve with a desal plant in Mexico, which does not solve the way the Colorado River actually functions. It's been 67 years now since the Colorado River touched the Gulf of California. But also in the Netherlands, we do things wrong. This is a swan. She built her nest on garbage. There were eggs, there were little swans, they were all okay, but a nest of garbage? Do we really think that that is taking care of our environment and our, our, our birds, our, our, our signature birds we have in the Netherlands? No. We use this picture, this image, to start a campaign to clean the canals of Amsterdam. And our queen can swim in it, but we still need these disastrous pictures that actually showcase a real disaster uh, to increase the capacity to change. 5,000 people die every day because of health issues directly related to water, and half of Africa does not have access to clean drinking water. And this uh, woman uh, on a small island state, Kirabash, uh, actually looks at uh, sea level rise, eating away her house. The picture is old, the house is gone. Kirabash, uh, uh, president, actually is buying land uh, on solid ground to, to give his people an opportunity to change. We need a, an approach I call transformative. Water is scarce. We don't have a lot of it. Now, if you talk to an astronaut, he will tell you the planet is blue. And it might be blue, but it's like the surface. It's paint. It's the carpet of the planet. If you take all the water we have, everything, in oceans, in rivers, in our aquifers, and you put it in a bulb, this is what you get. It's not even the size of the United States. And then if you think about what's in the bulb, the type of water you can use for drinking, industry, agriculture, it's the middle one, the size of the state of Kentucky or the Netherlands. That's it. Water is scarce, but we don't treat it scarce. We think there's enough. We flush our toilets with the water we should drink. Uh, there's no gray water system in our houses. Uh, we use water in too much. And then we think about sea level rise, we actually think there is too much. Water is scarce. We will feel and already feel the impact of climate change most profoundly through water. Climate change hits us hard, too much or too little in our faces. 90% of all disasters is already water related. Uh, two billion people will be devastated in the next decades because of too much water. 1.8 billion, almost another two billion in the decades after because of too little water. If you add that up, it's 40% of the world's population gone if we don't change the way we deal with water. And 15% of our economies are already eaten away by those disasters. Think about the aquifers. The, this is the great capacity of the, of, the, of the world, of our planet. This is what von Humboldt understood. The aquifers store water, but we take it out. We take it out at a rate and a speed that eats the aquifers away. And aquifers are natural systems. So you can't do this uh, 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 endlessly. 50% this summer, 50% of the aquifers, the big aquifers, are past their tipping point. Now, when you work in policy, you can write this and say, okay, 50% of the aquifers are past their tipping point. And you think, oh, might be bad. You know what it means, past their tipping point. It means that a natural recovery is impossible. So natural recovery is impossible. 
it will not restore itself. The tipping point actually means the point of no return was there. Was there, will not be there, was there. So our groundwater, what we need for fresh water, is at risk. Finance. Professor Hollicott did research on asset at risk around the world, uh, calculated and added them up. Hey, Miami leads the list. $278 billion at risk in 2050 because of sea level rise and surges. $278 billion. That's a business case. Uh, you can, you know, act upon this, you could say. The Netherlands is on the list too, number nine. Luckily, we have a good and clear protection scheme in place, but uh, it's scary. Now, there's another thing that is scary on this list. So you see the America, you know, you see America with New York and Miami lighting up. Of course, you see Southeast Asia, where it's very vulnerable, as in the cities are developed on coastlines and in riverine systems. But what is not lighting up? Africa. Now, this is 2050. If you know that demographic growth is going to be the most rapidly in Africa, Africa will double, and there's no red bulb on the uh, horizon for Africa, it means that this perspective, a financial economic perspective, is not the only way to look at it. Because this does not mean that there are no people at risk. It just does not mean that our financial portfolio, which we invest in, is at risk. Our houses, our offices, our, 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 our real estate that is highly valued, uh, adding up to 278 billion in Miami is at risk. But if we only focus on finance and economics for change, if those are the drivers for change, the poor of the world will lose out. We will forget about Africa if this is our focus. So we have to change the perspective. World Economic Forum put water as a number one risk for the next decade uh, a year ago. Water is in their top three all the time. It's the business community that actually warns us all that water is part of those top 10 risks. Do we change our behavior? Do businesses change? And if you add it all up, this is the world around water. It's also an urban world, a world where people flock to cities, uh, where there's opportunity. But hey, those cities are also vulnerable. Uh, they're developed and developing in uh, places at risk. Over 50% will live in those risky places in 2050. So in deltas, on riverines, and on coasts. This is where we live, this is where we invest, this is where our economy grows, and this is where it's vulnerable. And you see those deltas, the Mississippi one here, uh, where two football fields of coastline disappear every three or four hours on the coast, yeah? where the ecosystem is uh, 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 moving rapidly downhill. The, uh, the Pearl River Delta, the Dutch Delta, the Nile Delta, and the Niger Delta. Uh, to make it a little more complex, national security as being part of climate change, we have a lot of conflicts in the world. And a lot of these conflicts have an ori uh, origin in the way we deal about, about water, or conflicts are actually uh, uh, enlarged uh, by environmental issues. Now, the G7 put out a report, a new climate for peace, two years ago saying climate change is a matter of national security. So that's one. Second, water is at the core uh, of that security risk. I'm very sorry that I start so doom and gloom. Uh, uh, it's not my, you know, my spirit. Uh, I was uh, born and raised very optimistic and entrepreneurial, and I still am. So uh, don't worry, we will end on a positive and note to move forward, but you know, bear with me a little. Uh, I always wanna stand on a chair. And the left side, this is the World Economic Forum risk report that explains how risks work. And it tells us that all risks increase in frequency and impact. So tomorrow there are more, and it's gonna be worse. So this is nightmare. So if you wake up at night sweating, this is the part you were dreaming of. And this could be water crisis or climate change or biodiversity loss, but this could also be terrorism and wars and migration patterns. All risk, economic, social, cultural, and environmental increase in frequency and impact, more and worse. Nightmare. Luckily, World Economic Forum also explains that these risks are all interdependent. They're interdependent in their origin. Huh. This is where we have to form new ways of mitigation strategies. And in their impact. Huh. This is where we talk about adaptation. So 
impact and adaptation and origin and mitigation are connected. They're interdisciplinary, inter interdependent. So that means that if we are becoming more comprehensive in the way we deal with mitigation and adaptation, we are able to solve this crisis not only from the origin, but also in the way they impact us. But it's tough. And uh, the, the slide is high. I always uh, want to get close. It's tough. We're here. Now, if you're there and you look back, uh, the world is simple. So if everything's complex and doom and gloom, what do you do? Look back. You want to go back. You want to understand better. So that's logical. This is what happens with elections. People will paint you a picture where, you know, the 50s are a better perspective than the 2050s. But the future is our reality. There is no other way. But for that, we have to be able to understand that complexity. If we don't understand that complexity, we will fail in the way we build solutions. Because if the past is the reference for the way we build solutions, they will all fail. And at the moment, policies and rules and regulations are based on the past and not on the future. And that means that there is a mismatch, a gap. Now, you were children, or you have children, or you have grandchildren, or all three of them, uh, which is actually possible, and great-grandchildren, uh, if not. Uh, and perhaps you played this game. Who didn't? Who no doesn't know this game? Everybody knows. It's actually a test. It's an engineering test. Uh, so if you're you know, an engineer in the making, you solve it in a second. Eh? You put the, the blocks, the 3D blocks, in these two-dimensional spaces. If you play for it for the rest of the day, you're probably going to study you know, French or poetry or something like that. Uh, so there's this, this test. But I use it as a metaphor. I use it as a metaphor uh, for the challenge uh, we face. Because if the cube is the system of rules and regulations, of the way we govern, the way we make deals, the way we allocate funding, the way we communicate, the way we collaborate, if the cube is the existing system based on the past, then the solutions that fit are also based on the past. Now suppose we come up with solutions like this, eh? or uh, you know, an iPhone, or something else. It will never fit in the forms we designed before. So if we want to change the future and have a real impact, we have to bypass the system and then change it again so it will fit. And our rules and regulations should not be based on the past and the ways we deal with each other and how we govern the world and our nations, cities, and countries should not be based on our experience we had yesterday. We should be referenced the future. So we need the future. Now, the sustainable development goals agreed, we agreed upon actually try to reach for the future, but we have no system to implement them. So the implementation of the SDGs is going to be very complex because the current system can't uh, attribute them. And then we agreed in Paris on a two-degree world. Now, scientists from all over already say it's going to be impossible, but let's stick to the plan. Let's stick to this two-degree world because there was an ambition of a 1.5 to save Kiribati and its sister's uh, small island development state. But let's stick to the plan of a two-degree world. If you look at the curves of sea level rise and temperature rise and CO2 levels and so forth, they all go up. It's going to be bad. If we want to end up somewhere close to two, the curves have to change in the next five years. Now, that change cannot happen within the current system. But that change is also an opportunity, because 100 years ahead is a tough challenge for businesses. Looking 100 years ahead is impossible for politicians. But thinking about five years, you can build a business case, a plan, a business, a portfolio. Uh, it's something to be able to invest in, but it's also something you can run for office for. So five years we can tackle, five years we can understand. If we come up with the approach of changing the curves in the next five years, we are able to change the world. But we have no clue and no business case. The poor will lose out. 
We also have no time to waste. Climate change hits us hard. And we're in this lock-in, where this crisis and disasters from all over the world actually makes us, you know, have our hands tied on the back, and we don't know how to act upon it. This is after Katrina hit New Orleans. So there is a huge disconnect between the past and the future, and a huge disconnect in the way we deal with the past or dealt with it and have to deal with the future. We have to bridge the gap in a transformative way to build capacity. Okay. Water. No, okay. You know who this is? Robert Moses, very good. The infrastructure bully from New York, right? The engineer, yeah? He uh, built roads and rail and access to beaches. He didn't care about people, infrastructure, asphalt, concrete. That was his thing. And you know who that is? Jane Jacobs, the community worker. She didn't understand about infrastructure, but she knew everything about people. So she was, you know, the soul of the city. Uh, and this was the mind. So you had heart and mind. When I worked for President Obama in New York after Hurricane Sandy, we joked. These two fought each other in the times when New York was built. Uh, but suppose they got married and had babies, love childs from Moses and Jacobs. Perhaps that would, I mean, perhaps it's too idealistic. Uh, perhaps it's a dream. Perhaps this is not true. But it made us think of these two worlds we have to connect every time, the heart and the mind. There's no way we can only think by the heart. There's no way we can only think by the mind. We have to connect the two worlds. We have to connect the two worlds in a way that we come up with long-term comprehensive approaches. Long-term because we need that long-term approach. We need to look into that future, grab that as a reference, not the past. Comprehensive because we have to connect the dots. The interdependencies showed by the World Economic Forum and other researchers are critical for that understanding. So grasping the future in long-term comprehensive approaches. But we also know that a long-term comprehensive approach becomes a book that ends up in a shelf of a policymaker, perhaps on a, uh, on a coffee table in a dentist's practice. It can be inspirational if you have time to read, but most of the time we just shove it away and put it in a garbage bin. So if you don't connect that thinking and capacity to understand with short-term innovation, innovative interventions, if you don't act upon the long-term approach, it fails. But short-term interventions are incidents. If we just do things because we think they're good and they're not connected to a long-term approach, not connected in comprehensiveness, if they are not able to connect the dots, if it's not a string of interventions, but only incidents, our approach will fail. So it's this back and forth between long-term and short-term and long-term and short-term and in of in evaluating and, and changing all over that is critical. If we do that inclusively, if the collaboration is really inclusive, if we invite all in the process from the beginning until the end, and if we do it transparent, accountable to build business cases, we can build capacity. Capacity that's institutional in our businesses, communities, uh, governments, uh, academia, but capacity that is also individual on a personal level, uh, on the smallest scale possible. And with that, if you embrace that, you need something to connect this. You need an approach, a process. And I say it's design. It's design and planning that actually can connect the dots. It's design and planning that actually can excel on the collaborative part, that can excel on comprehensiveness, that can excel on inclusiveness, and that can excel on the fact that you can connect long-term and short-term, that you can come up with solutions that actually are based in that future and not in the past. Now, why design? Design is von Humboldt. It has these three capacities. It can solve things. It can, it's technical. You know, you can solve things with design and engineering. We say programmatic approach, solve it from a house, smallest scale, or a cup to drink coffee, to all the way to a national or international strategy. You solve it. But design reaches across. It reaches across time, looks back, and looks ahead. 
It reaches across scale, from the smallest scale to the world, and it reaches across sectors or interests, environmental, ecological, economical, social, and cultural. So design can connect the dots. Now, with that baseline of a technical and an opportunistic approach where you can make the connections, design also is aspirational and inspirational, and therefore political. So design can add to that political level from that understanding of connectivity. And therefore, design has the capacity to become transformative. That's why design is critical if you want to understand Van Humboldt. Now, if you want to reach to such a goal, you need ingredients. One, you need a safe place in the process. We all know that there's a big difference between collaboration and negotiation. With negotiation, it's about I want the best for myself or for my group. So I come in and I know what I want out of the conversation. Well, collaboration, I actually don't know what I want out of the conversation, but I do know I want to reach a goal. I want to set a goal, a target together, and reach for an ambition. So collaboration actually brings you always further. Negotiations are always disappointing. Uh, most of the times you lose a lot or a little. Only often or rarely do you gain uh, everything you came in for. So collaboration demands that we have trust. And trust you can only build in a safe place, in a process that is open, where I can show my heart and my mind. Uh, so a safe place in the process is critical, where governments, businesses, community, scientists, uh, uh, community workers, individuals can share experience, aspirations, and inspiration. Second, bypass the system. Get around the cube. You need a detour. I call it a sabbatical detour. You need to invest in time to buy, be able to bypass, to detour, to step outside of the lock-in to be able to say these rules and regulations, you know, I pause on this. Uh, I need to innovate, so we need to bypass. But it's a detour. You want to get back because you want to change the system. You want to change and have an impact. This cannot be an incident. That's why it's a detour. If you only step out of the system, it becomes a project or an, you know, an incident and it might fail. If you're able to bring that learning back evaluate and change, it's actually becoming progressive. So you detour. You need to look back to understand where we come from, to know the facts, not the alternatives. And you need to look ahead to actually find the alternatives, but then in the future, uh, the scenarios that inspire uh, 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 and bring a perspective. We need design, as I explained. There is no one a superhero in these type of processes, although a lot of people are actually heroes uh, and carry that inspiration. And we need the talent of the world to work with the talent of any place. We need all the talent we can find uh, to work together. And this is not about being a professional or non-professional. This is about the talent. Uh, the talent I found in the New York region with community leaders and people that suffered and connected that with talent of engineers and designers from all over the world. And we need to collaborate. Collaboration is at the heart. Be inclusive. In New York, I always said, the door is always open. You are never too late. And it was true. And it made the, complex pro uh, com and made the process complex. And my team you know, had a hard time, but we did it. Uh, open. Now, I'm from the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is a very vulnerable place. Uh, it's below sea level for 26%. Uh, uh, it's flood prone for 60%. Uh, it's also a place where that innovation has taken on, not for years or decades, but for centuries. So we want to bring that experience we have to the Netherlands to the world. We say it's a testing lab. Now, why is the Netherlands such a lab for innovation? Uh, now, this is the Netherlands in the 1600s. Uh, you say it's a, it's a wet place. It's uh, almost like the Everglades, uh, you could say. And um, uh, in the 1600, there was a lot of water. Now, we had a choice. We could make a plan and a business case. There's a phone ringing. It's yours, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you can pick it up. Uh, we could make a business case um, uh, out of that plan. Uh, but then, you know, we would have had to flee 
to Germany because that would never, you know, would have failed. But we did not. We invested in it. And why? Because there was water. And waters were river. And waters were meant that we could reach the world. We could travel the world and there was trade and transportation. There was great soil. So we could raise crops and cattle. Uh, and there were places that we could invest in to become safe. And those places became our cities. So we built our cities on the crossroads of water and roads and invested. Now we turned water into land, making more than three and a half thousand parcels of land, polders, that used to be water and turned them into land. And now the country is safe, uh, although flood prone, for 60%. And this started in the 1100s. This started before we were a kingdom. This started before we had a constitution. This started on the community level, where actually farmers got together and said, I have wet feet, and if I build a wall around my farm, the water goes to my neighbor, and I have a conflict. But if the two neighbors actually build a wall together in collaboration, they were both safe and saved guilders at that time. Now, if they did this on a community level, they could actually say the safety of the community, we can organize. So they started to organize themselves in regional water authorities. They paid taxes, and we had an authority that took care. Now, this was before there was a government. This was a water democracy, starting out of urgency. At a certain time, we had thousands of those regional water authorities. In current perspective, very inefficient, but very effective. We merged and merged and merged and merged, and now we have 21 of them. Still running the country for water safety, and the OECD assessed the water authorities as the best government system there is when it comes to water. We got an A+, plus, which is nice, but it's also inspirational because it was born out of necessity and out of a community understanding. Not only the need to have dry feet, but also the understanding and willingness to collaborate. And we had our floods in the 1400s and later, but we always responded out of two principles. The country had to be safe and our citizens, but we also need to add value. Safety and qualities are the core principles to build our place. Because only safety would get us a Moses country, or only quality a Jane Jacobs one, but marrying them from the beginning. And I know they're both not from Dutch origin, but still. That was in 53. We had our big disaster. We developed the Delta Works. In 95, another disaster where we evacuated 250,000 people. We invested in a program for room for the river, opening up our river system, reinvesting again. Uh, and thanks to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, it made us realize how vulnerable we are. Also in the Netherlands, we came up with our second Delta program. And now we have a commissioner for life that is there to stay. We have a program that's aimed for 2100 projects and a budget by law that projects funding for the next five, 15 years uh, and every year it's uh, uh, changed. But there's more than water safety. It's also water quality. Also our water becomes more saline uh, and our soil. Uh, and also we decline. Uh, so the Netherlands is, has not only a problem with too much water, but also with too little water. Our last dike collapsed, not because we had a flood, but because we had a drought. Uh, so water comes in different ways, also in the Netherlands. Drinking water and water quality are critical for our economy. Almost 20% of the Dutch economy directly depends on fresh water. So we better take care and not only uh, uh, clean the water and distribute it, but also have infrastructure that save and invest in innovation. And water has different faces. You know, it's about transportation, it's about building ships, it's about traveling the world, and therefore Rotterdam Harbor is still the biggest harbor of the world if we forget about China. I said today, it sounds like Trump. Well, I don't want to sound like Trump. Now, this experience we have uh, with water being such a cultural thing, not only an asset, but a way to live with it. We live with water every day. That experience and that expertise we want to bring to the world. And that's why the cabinet asked me to become their water ambassador, to build institutional capacity and form coalitions in other places so we can deal with that water risk that is so critical. 
not only in the deltas, but also in our cities, in the places, not only with our friends, but also with our you know, non-partners we have. So I work and we work all over the world with uh, uh, our, our embassies and uh, co consulates, like Natalie, who is here in the room, to see how we can form coalitions, uh, like in Chile or in Mexico, or uh, Bangladesh and Vietnam and Myanmar and Indonesia, uh, but perhaps also here in Miami. And we reach out to everyone. Uh, everyone should be included, institutional partners and non-institutional partners. And one of the things we started was a coalition of countries, because countries are also critical. They're a way of organizing. This Delta coalition is a coalition where 12 countries actually hold hands. They're all vulnerable and they're all critical and they're all riverine system. They're all at the end, the pit of the rivers. Uh, and they all have a hard time dealing with those risks. Uh, uh, we started a UN World Bank panel on water, the high level panel on water with 11 presidents and prime ministers, raising water to the top of the political agenda. So you need all these different perspectives. You need to work on the ground on projects that are inno innovative and transformative. And at the same time, you want to change policy. You want to change policy, politics. And you want to change the way we value our water rights. What's next? How can we change? How can de we deliver on that ambition? Or I would almost say, how can we deliver on, a, uh, on that promise? I think that changing the world does not start with talking. But changing the world starts with acting. But for that acting, you need that understanding. The understanding and the embracement of the complexity and the understanding that long term and short term are inclusively connected in a transparent way. Now, projects are places and people. Eh? Moses and Jacobs. We need both. And we have inspirations we brought. Room for the River in the Netherlands, uh, our, our Bangladesh Delta Plan, uh, uh, our collaboration with Egypt in the Nile Delta, in Myanmar, uh, the Ariwadi Delta, and working on the, uh, Yangon, uh, in Mozambique, where de we developed a master plan for the port, um, in Poland, where the economy is so much connected to the water system. In Vietnam, where the Mekong Delta actually crosses borders, but is very vulnerable uh, on, a, on a national security and international security scale. In Colombia, uh, using the Cauca River as an example to marry uh, urban and rural assets. Um, in Chile, where I was just uh, working on the collaboration between the Netherlands and Chile, enforcing and, and strengthening a water dialogue, increasing that understanding and that capacity, help build a, a water institute for better water governance, because water governance in Chile is not as good as it should be, and start to test, work on the ground, uh, as we will do in, Co in the Coquimbo region, as we just agreed upon. And with Mexico, we have a longer relationship that actually started with disasters and the response to those, uh, and now brings us to a coastal resiliency approach, which we're going to deliver and start uh, this year. A resiliency approach that, again, bring, comes with this ambition to have this long-term uh, stretch to think about the coast. And the coast of Mexico is complex. You have east and west, Gulf and uh, Pacific. Uh, but we will start to test with first pilot projects in the first year. Uh, and, of course, in New York, where I started Rebuild by Design. Now, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York uh, in October uh, 2012, it left a devastating impact. Uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, made us remind that President Obama had said, you can ignore the facts, but you can't deny them. That got a whole new meaning in the last month, I would say, or weeks. Eh? But there might be alternative uh, uh, if you ignore or deny them. But this principle on understanding risk. Uh, President Obama, in his first month in 2009, said, no Katrina on my watch. I don't want to see a federal government that's incapable of dealing with such a disaster. So he asked Secretary Napolitano and Secretary Donovan from uh, Homeland Security and Housing and Urban Development to come up with a proactive approach. Suppose a disaster would hit. In 2012, they were ready. Uh, they did it differently. But climate change is tough. And we know it's tough all over the world. It's tough also because it's slow. Uh, who 
would know what sea level rise was over the last 100 years? Ah, you, know, you would know, but you're the expert, so you can't compete in this competition. Who, well, you know, what is the sea level rise over the last 100 years? 20 centimeters. Who would say more? Who would say less? Who doesn't dare to speak up? That's the rest, eh? Yeah. How much is it, John? Yeah, a little more, uh, 24. Uh, if you divide that by 100, that's not a lot. So for a politician, sea level rise is not an incentive to change. If it's, you know, a year and, it, you know, I won't even, you know, I don't even notice. But sea level rise will increase. To how much, John? We don't know, but yeah, two or three meters at least. So all of a sudden, that 20 centimeters becomes three meters. And all of a sudden, it's a problem. But that's the future. I mean, if we don't want to acknowledge that future. Climate change is slow. When I worked in DC, we said climate change is slower than Congress. And you can imagine that's slow. Yeah. yeah. Sandy proved that the World Economic Forum risk report was right. Sandy showed that these dependencies were there. We did research on the region. The left side shows us that uh, poor people live in poor places all over the world, also here in the region. I was here in Newark, where it's purple, and purple means a mix between red and blue, and this is not Republicans and Democrats. This is about blue being the water and red being vulnerable. Vulnerable communities are at the forefront when it comes to water. There in Newark was an industrial site with low income housing and social housing. The water was this high. It raged through the community. The Environmental Protection Agency had to close the playgrounds because the soil lit up at night so contaminated the water was. So this is not only about a surge in an environmental disaster. These are the places that are at risk, that are at the forefront, where poor people live in the wrong places, in the risky places, where we don't invest in, where they have a much harder time to get back on their feet. Sandy also showed the regional vulnerability of infrastructure. 75% of the power supply in the floodplain. 80% of fuel storage in the floodplain and the next 20% just adjacent to this. It means with the new projections, 100% of fuel storage in the floodplain. This is New York City. Sandy showed the vulnerability of the region like a magnifying glass. Physical and social resiliency was all of a sudden out in the open. It showed that Manhattan was vulnerable. One power plant, one con ed power plant went out Half of Manhattan without power. It turned Manhattan into a no-po and a so-po, a north of power and a south of power. Except, of course, in the battery, where they took care of themselves. Now, with my Harvard students, we did research on the governance. Ah. And the governance of the region is fragmented. So this, when you think about institutional capacity, it's lacking. You have no mayors on Long Island, voluntary mayors on the Jersey Show, a big shot mayor in New York City, you have three different constitutions in New Jersey and New York and in Connecticut. And that fragmentation in a different position of a local, regional, or state authority made coordination and collaboration from a government perspective impossible. And then you have a regional authority that actually has the uh, capacity to implement, but it's hijacked by that same type of politics. Now, in that complexity, with this disaster hitting this vulnerable community, Congress uh, allocated $60 billion to help out and rebuild the region, and President Obama installed this Hurricane Sandy rebuilding task force. If you walk in the region with that complexity, with that much of a disaster, uh, and that, that impact, you think you can change. You think, yeah, well, a disaster. You can't waste an opportunity. Uh, you can't waste that opportunity. And then you come across a sign like this. And then you wonder, what happened? The man lost his house, his business, and his daughter. And all of a sudden, you understand that the disaster is not something that's abstract, but real. It hits people in the face. And this is exactly why people want to go back. They don't care about a Dutch guy with blue eyes saying, let's look at the future. They don't care about a president that says, 
Yeah? You can't ignore or deny the fact. They care about their daughter, their loved one, their friends, everything they lost, and they want to bring this back. If you want to increase capacity, you have to care. If you want to increase capacity, you don't come up with theories, but you are there. If you want to increase capacity, this is about collaboration, not about negotiation or standing on your rights. If you want to build capacity, you are there on the ground. That's exactly that understanding that building capacity and changing the world has to start from a personal perspective. You have to be there all the time and work with each other. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, Sean Donovan, uh, my boss on the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, was a great guy. He came to the Netherlands to learn about water, and he said, living in a delta, living with water, is cultural. Hank, can you make it cultural in New York? And I said, cultural in New York? In New York? In New York, where the response to disasters is only repair? where every dollar you invest in since the 80s is increasing, going up from 15 to almost $100 billion a year, and all that money is repair money, where it's not resiliently invested, where if we would do this resiliency, you would get a one to four, one to six, one to eight ratio. It's a business case, but you don't. This is what you do. This is federal policy. This is the this is the policy that actually tells you the only thing you can rebuild your house is according to the new standard. So this is what happened. You need time to think, rethink the way we embrace the future. President Obama did two things at the same time. A climate action plan, it's gone now. Uh, we worked on it. Uh, uh, and the Hurricane Sandy rebuilding strategy. We did with the Hurricane Task Force. With the, with the rebuilding strategy and with the task force, we had three objectives. One was first aid on the ground. Second, repair of critical infrastructure. And third, rebuilding. And I asked Sean Donovan, can we add a fourth? Can we focus on the future? That rebuilding actually becomes rebuild better. Use the perspective of tomorrow to increase that capacity. And he said, yes. And then I used the Dutch verb, and that says, Tom Pusfer is in a list, and I can't say it, but we have to find a way to bypass the system. That's about it. Find a way to invade in, federal, in the federal government and try, try to change the way we deal with that future uh, from within. We need a transformative approach. And that became Rebuild by Design, a competition ingrained in the culture of America of com competitiveness, but also ingrained in the America Competes Act with the Office of Science and Technology in the White House uh, taking care. A competition that was built on the capacity to innovate, but a competition that also changed the landscape on how to compete. This was not a competition where normally you would say, this is the problem, throw it at society, give us your, my sol your solution. No, this was a competition that said, we don't have a clue. We don't know what went wrong, but we have to get a better understanding of the interdependencies and vulnerabilities of the region to get to opportunities that have transformative capacity. Let us understand first, let's collaborate to unravel this region in all its aspects and then discover opportunities to intervene, opportunities that we could replicate and scale up that could be inspirations for the rest of the region and perhaps the rest of the world. So we did not need ideas, we needed talent. So we did a call for talent and we got 148 teams from all over the world. We selected 10, and those 10 teams had over 250 professionals from all backgrounds, but they were led by designers because design, and I won't repeat myself, has this capacity to organize that. These 10 teams were tasked to do a research, not on their own, but as a collective. And we supported them with our team uh, uh, of the University uh, of New York, New York University Institute for Public Knowledge, the Regional Plan Association, uh, the Van Halen Institute, and the Municipal Art Society. We supported the teams in their research and their capacity to reach out. They were on the ground, on bikes, walking the beaches, on buses, in cars, in trains. They worked with everyone and we built a coalition, 
a coalition of over 500 organizations, small and big in the region, that together brought understanding of vulnerability. We worked with community leaders, with people that lost everything with the, in the soup kitchen on New Jersey Beach, uh, all the way to the mayoral office in New York or the state office of Governor Christie of Governor Cuomo. We worked with the voluntary mayors as much as with the institutional ones, with businesses and academia and all. We brought that understanding and that understanding brought us over 40 opportunities. And out of those 40, over 40 opportunities, we selected 10 for each team one. And each team then was tasked not to come up with a solution, but to come up with a coalition first. Because we needed that collaboration. We needed a collaboration on the ground, out of an understanding and out of the capacity of the local talent to be met with that talent of the teams. Uh, those 10 teams brought 10 solutions to the forefront that were innovative that had the capacity. So they presented their 10 uh, ideas to a jury and we selected six, and those six were awarded uh, uh, $920 million for implementation. Rebuild by Design took a regional approach. It deep dived into regional interdependency and vulnerability and connected it with a local need. It had four partners, it had the grantees, it had the federal agencies, and it was supported by six foundations, funders, with the Rockefeller Foundation in the lead, but also the JPB Foundation, Deutsche Bank, New Jersey Recovery Fund, the Hearst Foundation, and the Cerdner Foundation. Ten teams, an international jury, but especially a real local need connected in the process. These ten teams worked on the region. They worked on architecture and urban design and landscape. They worked across scales from uh, 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 time. They came up with plans and plannings as much as with projects. They connected the politics of the big guys with the local needs and the communities. Uh, they did this by design, so they proved the approach was right. How much time do I have? I've already gone beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, mu how, much, how much did I go beyond? Fifteen. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, so I'll do this quick. This is the project in uh, the Netherlands. This is Soprano country. This is where they bury their bodies. This is like the Everglades of New York, or I can't say New York because it's New Jersey. Um, that swamp lost all its capacity, and the team brought it back. Uh, the, the swamp is polluted. There's no way it can actually function as a sponge, and the team did a regional approach to bring that back safeguarding all the communities around it, but also bringing more economic vitality and social resilience. Uh, OMA team focused on Hoboken, not coming up with a project, uh -huh, somebody's lighting up, uh, but in a, a, a planning approach, uh, protecting the city of Hoboken with interventions of protection, uh, building capacity to store the water and discharge it. Uh, a room for the river program on Long Island, we urbanize our rivers and we, you know, we straighten them out. The team found that that rivers, those perpendicular rivers that are along the coast, actually hold the capacity to build resiliency. Hunts Point, the food market, without the food market, New York is out of food in one and a half days. In the floodplain, no protection. But it's also the poorest, one of the poorest communities in the US, the highest asthma rates among kids. That's because the trucks go back and forward. There was no collaboration between the food market and the community. The team actually set up camp in Hunts Point and brought those people together. At the jury uh, presentation, they brought over 70 people of their coalition to advocate for the plan. The big you, the one that married J J Jacobs and, and Moses uh, from the beginning, actually said, we, we need a wall around Manhattan, but a wall is not a good idea. Uh, so they brought a regional, an, an approach where they worked uh, house by house, street by street, community by community, finding solutions that fit on the community scale, bringing protection with social measures, bringing protection with a local need. First phase is now uh, funded, second phase is funded, and uh, we probably will dig the first phase in the end of this year.
and uh, the escape team uh, that built the capacity to protect Staten Island from flooding, not by a wall or new dunes, but by oysteries, uh, bringing back the oysters to the, uh, the New York Bight, increasing the environment and the, uh, uh, the quality of the water. They worked with the harbor school, uh, uh, bringing the kids to the beaches, and the kids brought their parents for a better understanding. We allocated $920 million for disaster recovery funding. It was a competition based on the leadership and collaboration, driven by innovation and ownership on the ground by design. It informed an, uh, uh, an approach where I was asked to do this again on the national scale. So we did the National Disaster Resiliency Competition. We also developed a challenge for the Horn of Africa, the Sahel, in Southeast Asia. Um, we're now launching the challenge in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, uh, this ripple effect made me realize that Rebuild by Design was not so much about a plan, but about changing the culture on how do you do this thing. Now, we need to change the culture to bypass the system. There is no other way. Now, Miami embraced the 100 Resilient Cities program. Rockefeller might say, uh, Rockefeller embraced Miami, but you know, this is just a way of perspective. Uh, a program that actually might be able to bring that capacity to the region. Uh, but what then are the key hotspots to intervene on? Uh, is it the city, uh, the beach, uh, or uh, uh, the Everglades? Think about what the opportunities are in this part of the world to bridge that gap. Find those interdependencies that actually make it possible to start to build resiliency on the short term that invokes long-term comprehensive approaches. And see if Miami uh, and South, South Florida can be an inspiration for the world, where what we develop here can actually be replicated and built across uh, the world. Because water and resiliency don't demand a local approach, but a global approach. Uh, a global approach that is not about a plan, but about changing a culture. Because in the end, it's not so much about me and you, but more about them the next generation. Thank you.